Appamata's programs and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support makes a huge difference. There's a link for contributions on the website at appamata.org slash contribute. Xin Xin Ming Sen Khan. The great way is difficult for those who are unattached to their preferences. Let go of longing and aversion and everything will be perfectly clear. When you cling to a hair's breadth of distinction, heaven and earth are set apart. If you want to realize the truth, don't be for or against. The struggle between good and evil is the primal disease of the mind, not, <coughs> not grasping the deeper meaning. You just trouble your mind's serenity. As vast as infinite space, it is perfect and lacks nothing. But because you select and reject, you can't perceive its true nature. Don't get tangled in the world. Don't lose yourself in emptiness. Be at peace in the oneness of things, and all errors will disappear by themselves. If you don't live the Tao, you fall into assertions or denials. Asserting that the world is real, you are blind to its deeper reality. Denying that the world is real, you are blind to the selflessness of all things. The more you think about these matters, the farther you are from the truth. Step aside from all thinking, and there is nowhere you can't go. Returning to the root, you find the meaning. Chasing appearances, you lose their source. <coughs> At the moment of profound insight, you transcend both appearance and emptiness. Don't keep searching for the truth. Just let go of your opinions. For the mind in harmony with the Tao, all selfishness disappears. With not even a trace of self-doubt, you can trust the universe completely. All at once you are free with nothing left to hold on to. All is empty, brilliant, perfect in its own being. In all the world of things as they are, there is no self, no non-self. If you want to describe its essence, the best you can say is not to. In this, quote, not to, nothing is separate and nothing in the world is excluded. The enlightened of all times and places have entered into this truth. In it, there's no gain or loss. One instant is 10,000 years. There is no here, no there. Infinity is right before your eyes. The tiny is as large as the vast. When objective boundaries have vanished, the vast is as small as the tiny when you don't have external limits. Being is an aspect of non-being. Non-being is no different from being. Until you understand this truth, you won't see anything clearly. One is all, all are one. When you realize this, what reason for holiness or wisdom? The mind of absolute truth is beyond all thought, all striving, is perfectly at peace. For in it, there's no yesterday, no today, no tomorrow. It seems to be describing something different in our ordinary way of being. At its core, Sangam <clears throat> left us this as an instruction how to practice, how to find liberation that the Buddha was talking about.
Zen's been described as a special transmission beyond all words and letters, which is a saying we use to remind us that you know, things like this aren't the absolute truth, but it's a pointer. <clears throat> and these words and letters are pointing the way to freedom. The one thing the Buddha taught was liberation from suffering. <clears throat> and no, not the uh, typical way it's translated as life is suffering. When you say it that way, it sounds like an ideological statement. Buddha didn't make these ideological statements. A better translation or a better explanation comes from, I'm going to use uh, Mu Song's book, Trust in Mind, which is a commentary on the Shin Chen Yu. He begins by talking about the Dharma that's contained in the Shin Chen Yu, or Trust in Mind, and how it's right there readily apparent, structured differently. Dukkha is more properly translated as a sense of unsatisfactoriness, unease, stress, alienation, anguish all of which indicate the concrete experience of quantifiable psychological or physiological stresses. So he's saying dukkha is this experience of stress, the experience of unsatisfactoriness, anguish, something concrete. The polytext record the Buddha as saying, Sabe Sankara Dukkha, literally meaning all formations have the characteristics of Dukkha. However we translate the term Dukkha, nowhere in Buddhist canon do we find the broad declaration that life is suffering. Sabe Sankara Dukkha, all formations have the characteristics of Dukkha. So the Buddha's teachings at its core are to address sankharas, mental formations or constructions. His teachings are psychological and existential guides rather than a broad metaphysical declaration about life being one way or another. Along with this core teaching, Sabe Sankara Dukkha, again, that is, all formations have the characteristics of Dukkha, of unsatisfactoriness, of something not quite right. <clears throat> There's two other core teachings that are associated, Sabe Sankara Anicca and Sabe Dhamma Anatta. Sabe Sankara Anicca is all constructions have the nature of impermanence. Sabe dhamma anatta. All phenomenon have the nature of non-self. If we take these three together, what we notice is that the attributes of impermanence and non-self may be features of all constructions. All constructions are impermanent. All have no abiding self. These are attributes or features of the mental constructions and formations. Dukkha is very much a psychological feature resulting from our relationship to those constructions.
So it's about our relationship. The dukkha comes from a misguided or misinformed relationship to sankharas, to mental constructions and formations. It's because we believe they're permanent. It's because we believe there is a core abiding self that we suffer when we're wrong. Buddha's main enterprise was to speak to these skewed relationships rather than the constructions themselves. He goes on to say that samsara is just nothing more than the world of constructions. So dukkha is a result of the quality of our relationship to our mental formations, to our sankharas, sangang. The great way isn't difficult for those who are unattached to their preferences. But there you go, you pretty much said it in the front in the first line. It's not so difficult. Just don't be attached to your preferences. Let go of longing and aversion and everything will be perfectly clear. When you cling to a hair's breadth distinction, heaven and earth are set apart. In classic Buddhist formation, formulation, excuse me, the basic cause of dukkha or anguish are greed, hatred, and delusion. Greed is the factor of wanting to grasp and hold on to things or experiences we like or love. Hatred or aversion is the other extreme of wanting to push away things or experiences we dislike. When we closely examine our own personal world of preferences, of picking and choosing this over the other, we find we are essentially trapped in a world of reactivity, pulled this way and that in response to what we like or don't like. But through meditation, we can cultivate a way of being in which this reactivity is absent. And then it is as if we are looking at things directly rather than through a distorting lens. Sengang tells us clearly, completely let go of all conditioned reactivity. Live through non-reactivity, and each moment will be a new perceptual unit in which we can act freely and appropriately. <clears throat> One of the core teachings in our way is that of shunyata, emptiness. And we understand that all formations, all appearances are empty. When the nature of the self and the nature of phenomenon are both understood to be informed by shunyata, emptiness, there is a gradual erosion of existing edifice of constructions as well as a slowdown of new construction making. I'll try and say that in a way that's easier to understand. He's pretty academic here. When the nature of self and the nature of phenomenon, of sankharas, of formations, are both understood to be empty, There's an erosion of the existing constructions and a slowing down 
of the process of making new ones. We began to chip away at this edifice by cleansing the lens of perception to see how the cycle of longing, clinging, and becoming is working in our life to cause dukkha. This is a long, painful process and is not likely to happen overnight. Some of you may have noticed. But its effect is to gradually build up a sense of equanimity, upeksha, that provides a counterweight to the reactivity of likes, likes and dislikes. In those moments when likes and dislikes have been truly replaced by equanimity, everything becomes clear and undisguised, Sengang tells us, revealed to be empty of our own being. From this perspective, we are aware of the space between the primary point of direct apprehension of the lack of own being and things and the secondary moment of their appropriation. I'm gonna say that part again. From this perspective, I'm gonna paraphrase actually in my own words to try and convey it. From this perspective, we become aware of the process of the gap between when we directly apprehend the lack of own being, we see that emptiness, and the secondary moment when we appropriate it, when we take that idea and then we create the next story about it. We are aware of our own freedom to not appropriate any experience. The moment you realize you're creating a story about what's happening, you are free from it. Not permanently, but in that moment you are free from it. We are aware of our freedom to not appropriate any experience, to not fit into our conditioned matrix of likes and dislikes, to not make a story out of it. So Sengang is instructing us, it's not that difficult. Just don't be attached to your preferences. Just let go of longing and aversion. As soon as you start to make a distinction, heaven and earth are set apart. Now we're back in dualism. Now we're back in us and them, absolute and relative. The struggle between good and evil is the primal disease of the mind. Not grasping the deeper meaning, you just trouble your mind's serenity. As vast as infinite space, it is perfect and lacks nothing. But because you select and reject, you can't perceive its true nature. Here's Musong's commentary about this line, and he, he translates it differently in this version. He's using a different translation. In our book, it's the line, the struggle between good and evil is the primal disease of the mind. Here it's translated as, to set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. 
is commentary. Ever since we started using our neocortex and its associated language-based selfing, selfing, to make the self, to redo yourself, it's a verb, what you do, it's selfing. Ever since we started using our neocortex in its associated language-based selfing, we have carried on chatter within ourselves. The nature of the internal chatter is to proliferate itself in even more complex ways. Prapancha in Pali is a wonderful Buddhist word for this proliferation. Prapancha. Sounds Spanish to me <laughs> for some reason. It does not matter what the sources of prapancha are. The fact remains that proliferation keeps the engine of internal chatter going at all times. Degrees of insanity or sanity depend on the volume and intensity of this internal chatter. In the case of a person untrained in the Dharma, this internal chatter, especially when chattering about, quote, what I like or, quote, what I don't like, is the disease of the mind. The internal chatter creates a feedback loop in which selfing feeds upon itself and creates an ever more complex proliferation, like a virus infecting all parts of the system. Buddhist meditation transition, um, <clears throat> Buddhist meditative traditions have found ways of transcending the internal chatter and clarifying those aspects of mind wisdom that have not been infected by the disease of internal chatter. When we transcend the internal chatter, we enter, quote, silence. The heart mind become illuminated by the inherent wisdom of the mind itself. This silence slash wisdom, this silence wisdom does not make distinctions, does not dwell in dualities of this or that, for or against, and yet is aware of itself as a purified state. This awareness is not subject object relationship or verbal or ideological for any verbalization or conceptualization is part of the internal chatter and eventually self-defeating. Confused? Clear? <laughs> the more you think about these matters, the further you are from the truth. So I guess we have permission to just, you know, chuck it and move on. Aren't, we're just sitting here thinking about it, aren't we? <clears throat> So which is it? I said study was an important part of Zen training. Sen Kong says, don't think about it.
are the key instruction you get when you go see a Zen master. When you want to find freedom, when you want to find the source of this dukkha, this dis-ease, unsatisfactoriness, they would just tell you, just sit. That's our main practice, as we've done here this morning for about two hours before we started our study. We just sit. We express our realization that this is it, just like this. There's nothing to add, nothing to take away. Dogen used to call it practice realization. One word, like hyphenated, practice realization. There was no distinction between realization and practice. They were one thing. Practice is how realization moves. It's what it does. The Buddha talked about how this chatter, how this human condition works in the chain of causation. Describing the links between longing, clinging, becoming, selfing basically. The 10th link in the chain of dependent, dependent arising is bhava in Pali and Sanskrit. And that word can be translated as both being, you know, to physical manifestation, being, and becoming, the verb. One word can be translated either way. No distinction within that word between the person and, the, and how they're changing and what they're becoming. A proper understanding of bhava, therefore, is being in becoming. Three words hyphenated. Being in becoming. In each moment of human experience, there is a subject, a being impacted upon by sensory input from the environment and being changed by it, becoming. And thus, in each moment, there is always a subject in the process of being reconfigured, however slightly or subtly. A thought, for example, is not a simple event happening statically to a thinker. It is changing the thinker by its impact. And since the thinker has thought the thought in the first place, the thinker being is the thought becoming itself. And thought itself is the thinker. A thought is not a simple event happening to a thinker. It is changing the thinker by its impact. Maybe it's a good time for an example. If you have a thought that makes you angry, it might raise your blood pressure. It might cause you to clench your fists. It might increase your heart rate. It has an impact. And since the thinker 
has thought the thought in the first place, the thinker, the being, is the thought becoming itself. Baba, being in becoming. The two are inseparable processes rather than two distinct entities. Being and becoming becomes an entirely experiential, self-contained posture that does not need any metaphysical speculation for its manifestation. When being and becoming operates through longing and clinging, it gives rise to confusion and unsatisfactoriness. When being and becoming operates through conscious release of clinging, it gives rise to a sense of ease in the world of becoming without requiring a notion of a being. I'll leave you with uh, some comments from Sung San Sanin, which is Mu Song's teacher, the Korean Zen teacher. And this comes from his commentary, Sung San's commentary on the Heart Sutra. He used to say, human beings have no meaning, no reason. Human beings have no meaning, no reason. It's kind of shocking. But he was making a classically Buddhist point. If all things are dependently arisen according to causes and conditions, there is no inherent meaning in the appearance of things. This is a, the terrifying aspect of the wisdom of Shunyata. And to leave it at that would be nihilistic indeed. So we're going to end here. Because one of the pitfalls of the Buddhist practice is to fall into the trap of thinking it doesn't matter. If it's all chatter, if it's all sankaras, formations, we can begin to think it doesn't matter. It does matter. You're given specific instructions for Zen practice of how to practice. It matters. What you do matters. What you energize matters how you meet those in front of you 
matters. New song speaking here. My teacher would point out further that we have a choice of turning no meaning into great meaning, capitalized, and thereby entering fully into the Bodhisattva's paradigm of Mahayana tradition. The compassion of the Bodhisattva is for the world of appearances in which deluded beings are caught in their own trap and experiencing varieties of dukkha. The Bodhisattva is motivated to find innumerable upaya or skillful means to address these varieties of dukkha, but never loses sight of the ultimate truth of emptiness of own being. The Bodhisattva is never confused about the source of the world of appearances through numerous upaya, the bodhisattva can manifest equally numerous varieties of compassion, each appropriate to the dukkha causing situation at hand, without ever turning compassion into yet another conceptual category. Thank you very much. I think we may have a, a few minutes if anyone has any questions. I don't know how we do that. Maybe Nancy as the monitor knows. I guess you can unmute everyone. Uh, yeah, everyone Hello. can unmute themselves right now. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have a question. Um, what books were you reading from? Those seem very interesting, and I'd like to look them up. Sure. Um, well, the chant we were getting out of the Appamata chant book, which is on the website, and the commentary, this is called Trust in Mind, which is by Mu Song. The subtitle, I always forget the subtitle because it's good. Trust in Mind, The Rebellion of Chinese Zen. Todd, I have a question. Um, in the past, sometimes you've done a wonderful like um, guide through your own mind of this process that you described in a intellectual and historical context, but how that plays out like in the everyday and in just an ordinary human mind like ours. Um, would you be up for the, the one I remember is um, it was just an ordinary thing for you. It was going out to play golf with with some other guys. Um, are you willing to give an example that kind of guides us through what that process looks like inside our heads? I'll try. Um, I don't remember. I remember. Raise that. Will you try? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you'd like an example of how the ordinary human process unfolds? That's what well, you're. Um, yeah, you, you were describing at the kind of intellectual and historical level um, how it is that our brain is constantly creating stories and information that then creates suffering because our desires don't quite match up with what's happening because of the inherent, um, you know, reality of things. And so, you know, that can play out in just a moment in traffic or at the grocery store or, at home, just it's kind of like the daily momentary process, but we don't think about it in, you know, he's using words like, you know, um, constructs of the mind and we're having thoughts or feelings or um, beliefs. And so just, um, I know for myself, it was a huge teaching. One of the times that I heard you really like go through that process 
of like identifying, oh, I've just created a story about that. And in my body, I'm feeling, you know, this and just how, how that happens. I think you explained it pretty well right there. <laughs> what? I don't, I'm not sure what I could add to that. You know, <laughs> we, we live our life through stories, someone has said, right? <clears throat> Trying to make sense of our world. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you're a person that feels like there's something wrong with that, you're in the right place. There's, a, I think there's only one thing you need to do to be liberated. Just don't believe it. Just understand that it's provisionally true. It's not ultimately true. <clears throat> when you've lost your car, you can remember, oh, I have a red truck. That's true. Just remember it's not ultimately true. <clears throat> that it will be gone soon. Hopefully not stolen. It's just that simple. In the moment that you realize the story you're telling yourself, you are free. And that's a drastic oversimplification because small mind comes back in and says, oh, I just don't have to believe what I'm saying now. I'm free now. I'm a liberated being. Who's saying that? Well, that's another story, right? It, and so it goes, and so it goes, and so it goes. One of my kind of burning questions as a Zen student working with my teachers is, when do you believe it? When do you go look for your red truck? When do you call the police, right? Don't get, you can't live in the world of emptiness. You can't deny that the world is real. Tell that to your children. Tell that to your mother. It doesn't work. You're helping no one. I'm looking for the line here. Don't get tangled in the world, right? In sankaras, in formations, in constructions. Don't lose yourself in emptiness. That's just the mirror image of dukkha. It looks like liberation. Now you're just caught on the other side. All is empty, brilliant, perfect in its own being. In all the world of things as they are, there is no self, no non-self. You have to get rid of both stories, both sides. One of the most important teachings in our way is not to, not one. If you think your body and mind are two, you're wrong. If you think your body and mind are one, you're also wrong. Body, mind, you and other are not two and not one. They both are and aren't. Peg likes to say that Zen is a perspectival, meaning any perspective, anti or particular perspective. It is the mind that can take any perspective, pliable, 
flexible. It's a great practice. I invite you, the next time you think, you notice you have an opinion, stop immediately and take the opposite one. Try it on. When you notice you have an opinion, stop and take the opposite opinion. Not permanently. That is Zen practice. And uh, if you're like me, what you'll discover is you really don't want one. You really want the other one. <laughs> you have a strong preference. All right, it is 8.50. I think we are beyond time, aren't we? I think that's enough. I thank you very much for your participation.